okay to those on youtube the uh, lecture on the 13 principles of faith numbers 12 and 13 with rabbi yossi Goldman will start in approximately five minutes Good evening, everybody. We will be starting shortly. Stay tuned.
<clears throat> we'll give it another minute or two. People are still joining. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. And <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so we uh, apologies for Monday night. Thanks to load shedding, there was havoc, <clears throat> both for me and for many of you. So they said load shedding would finish on Wednesday morning, so we thought Thursday night was safe. Now there's more load shedding. So uh, I hope, uh, I know some people were struggling because they had load shedding as well tonight. Hopefully they can get on, maybe on their phones, if they have uh, Zoom on their phones. But either way, the show goes on, and we are, we will please God, we'll post it, uh, the recording, for those who couldn't make it live. And... Uh, we are about to conclude this very exciting and important series on the Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith, the Code of Jewish Belief and uh, Jewish Philosophy and Theology, what a Jew must believe in order to be considered a believing Jew. And we've gone through 11 of the 13 principles and tonight we will conclude with some of the more exciting ones. Moshiach and the revival of the dead, the final chapter. So let's begin with looking at the text. Again, if you should have a, happen to have handy an art scroll sitter, it's optional, but uh, you may wanna look at the text of the Animamin on page 180, <clears throat> not written by the Rambam, but taken from the Rambam's 13 principles and put into short, brief statements. Number 12, Animamin, I believe with perfect faith, with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah, Mashiach, and even though he may delay, or as the old translations say, he may tarry, nevertheless, I anticipate every day that he will come. Animamin, you know the famous song, right? Um, 
באמונה שלמה בביאס המשיח, ואף על פי שיש במאי עם כל זה אחת עולה בכל יום שיובל. In Yigdal, which we sing on Friday night, which encapsulates the 13 principles of faith, ישלח לקץ היומין משיחנו, לבדוי זמחה כקץ ישוע עושי. By the end of days, he will send our Messiah, literally our anointed one. That's what Mashiach means. Did you know that? What does Mashiach mean? Mashiach means the anointed one. And he will send our Mashiach to redeem those longing for his final salvation. That's what we say in Yigdal, and we'll talk more about that just now. So, they tell a story about in the shtetl, there was a guy who couldn't make a living, Nebuch. He was uh, perennially unemployed, kept losing a job, couldn't hold down a job. So the community decided to help him out and give him some sheltered employment. So what job did they give him? They, gave him a, they built a watchtower at the edge of the town, And they said, Yankel, you are going to spend nine to five on the watchtower. And your job is to look out for Mashiach. And as soon as you spot Mashiach coming, you run to the rabbi and the city and the city elders, and you give them the good news that Mashiach has arrived. After a couple of weeks, his friend says, no, how's the new job going? He says, eh. The pay is not so good, but I think the job security is outstanding. Now that is a cynical joke about somebody who didn't really believe that Mashiach was a reality, that Mashiach is really going to come. And once upon a time, there was a very strong belief, and... Uh, Maybe later we'll mention even how the martyrs of the Holocaust went to their deaths singing that song. I believe in the coming of Mashiach, and even though he may tarry, and even though right now I'm suffering and I'm actually going to die, I still believe that the end will be good. And we will have the final word, not the Nazis. <clears throat> But not everybody always had that belief. <clears throat> I once heard about a professor in the Hebrew University who uh, taught his students that Mashiach is a concept. Uyavo. But we don't believe he's just a concept. The Rambam makes it very clear. <clears throat> he's not only a concept. He is a human being, born of father and mother. <clears throat> A person <clears throat> and he has to have a lineage he has to come from the correct stock in order to qualify to be the Mashiach so uh, he's not a concept he's not a fantasy he is a dream we've dreamt about Mashiach for millennia uh, even Jacob on his deathbed wanted to tell his children when Mashiach was coming And many uh, great leaders over the ages have predicted when Mashiach might come, but the Ramah himself says we shouldn't get involved in predictions. We should just believe with wholehearted faith that he's coming, and please God, he can come today. He can come right now, and we hope and pray that he will. Because when he comes, not only will the world come to its final destiny, and achieve its ultimate purpose of creation. Not only will be he rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, which we'll talk about later, but there'll be an end to human suffering. I personally, you know, the, the Rebbe wrote that, that when he was a child, he had this dream of Mashiach and the glorious Beit HaMikdash once again, and the Kohen Gadol and the great temple in Jerusalem and the glory of the Jewish people in its eternal capital. <clears throat> I'm not on that level. I personally, uh, for me, what really moves me when I pray for Mashiach is that there should be an end to human suffering because that's what will be at the end of days. There will be no more wars, there will be no more illness, there will be no more evil, uh, and uh, things will be good for everybody. So, 
Um, <clears throat> the Rambam writes that there are many biblical proofs throughout the Tanakh, throughout the Bible, the Chumash and especially the prophets. I'm not going to go through all the scriptural proofs and allusions that we find in the Chumash and in the prophets. That's maybe for another shir. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, the Rambam himself says there are numerous proofs where the Bible speaks about it, not directly and openly, but in a somewhat veiled fashion. The prophets were more direct and more explicit. Um, and uh, the Rambam writes in his commentary on the Mishnah, where the 13 principles come from, one who doubts or minimizes this principle that Mashiach will come, denies the whole Torah. Now, the Rambam writes, one of the criteria for Mashiach, as we said, he has to be a human being, but not just any Shlemiel can claim to be Mashiach. There's been lots of Mishagoyim over the years who thought they're Mashiach, you know? They usually wind up in, uh, in certain uh, insane asylums. But uh, the concept of Mashiach has been so powerful that even Mishagoyim, people who are not well, uh, dream and fantasize and, and, and th that they are the Messiah. The Rambam writes, Mashiach must be a descendant of King David. So we're talking about a human being who comes from a particular family from the tribe of Judah and the family of King David, which tells us that if you're a Kohen or a Levi, in case you had any doubts, you are not Mashiach. I'm sorry. I see we have some Kohanim and Levim in the audience. Uh, sorry, Nathan. You can't be Mashiach. <laughs> You're a great guy, but you can't be Mashiach. Mashiach cannot be a Kohen or a Levi. He has to come from the tribe of Judah. So he has to be an Israelite. Now, most of us don't know which tribe we come from. There were certain illustrious people who had family trees and genealogies tracing back generations that uh, they knew where they came from. So that's another thing. He has to come from the family of King David. And we find in history that the great Maccabees, the heroes of the Hanukkah story, as heroic as they were at the time, later they faltered a bit because they appointed themselves not only as the Kohanim, but also as the kings of the Jewish people. And that was wrong, because kings have to be from the Davidic, the Davidic dynasty, the dynasty of King David, who was not a Kohen. He was from the tribe of Judah. So it was a mistake of the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, to take the, the monarchy for themselves. Now, here's a question for you. What do you think? What is the title of Mashiach? Are we going to call him Horav, Rabbi Mashiach? Are we going to call him uh, Dayan, you know, like a member of the Beth Din? Are we going to call him a Novi, a prophet? No, Melech HaMashiach, no? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Melech HaMashiach is quite right. Although he will be a rabbi and he will be a prophet and he will be a judge, he'll be all of the above, but his title, his status is a king. And that's why he has to come from King David. So we speak of Melech HaMashiach and we speak of Mashiach ben David and David, specifically David and Shlomo through King Solomon as well. Mashiach will be a very great king. The whole world will serve him. Anyone who rises up against him will be destroyed. Now the question is, what will the world be like when Mashiach comes? We have this, uh, we imagine that the world is going to be totally different and money is going to grow on trees and uh, all kinds of utopian images we have. The Rambam actually shatters a lot of those images. He says, and he's quoting the Gemara here, the Gemara in Brochus 34b, 
Ain bain. There is no difference between this world as we know it today and the messianic age, except subjugation by foreign governments will cease. In other words, we will no longer be oppressed and persecuted as we have been for millennia, the Jewish people, which is quite fascinating. It's quite different because um, whilst we are saying that there's not that much difference, life will continue as normal, so to speak, and the main difference will be that the Jewish people will not be subjugated, that means that something dramatic will indeed happen, and that is that there will be no more anti-Semitism. Can you believe it? Can you imagine a world without anti-Semitism? But rich and poor will still exist, so money will not grow on trees. Strong and weak will still exist. Although elsewhere, I must say, the Rambam seems to be a bit contradictory. And he does say that life will be plentiful and there'll be plenty and abundance for everybody. So it didn't sound like there'll be the poor. But here he also says that rich and poor, strong and weak will exist. Now, let me quote to you directly from the Rambam. Um, he quotes a verse from Isaiah. Umala ha'aretz deya. The earth, the world, will be filled with deya. What is deya? Knowledge. Dot. The world will be filled with what kind of knowledge? Not Google, not Encyclopedia Britannica. The world will be filled with the knowledge of God. There will be a divine revelation that people will experience godliness firsthand. We will feel the presence of Hashem. The prophet Isaiah says further, a famous verse that is on the wall outside the United Nations in New York. Lo yiso goy el goy cherev, lo yilmedu oid milchoma, nation shall not rise up against nation. There will be war no more. How's that? So life will be quite different on the one hand, but on the other hand, life will continue as we know. It's not going to be like some kind of, not going to be Martians in outer space, and it's not going to be uh, daily miracles necessarily. Life will continue a sort of natural life. Further quotation from the Rambam directly. We do not hope for the messianic age in order to be able to gain great wealth, nor to be able to indulge in wine and horses as many confused people imagine. You know, people think um, utopia, oh, wine, women, and song. You know, I'll lay on a white sand beach and uh, six damsels uh, in various states of dress or undress will feed me grapes. You know, that's some people's idea of paradise. That's not what paradise is about, and it's certainly not what Mashiach about, is about. It's not what Olam Haba is about. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It'll be much better than that. Those are all temporal, physical, momentary pleasures. We're talking about eternal pleasures. So we won't be looking for wine and horses, as confused people imagine, says the Rambam. Rather, our saints and sages have longed for the Messianic age all throughout the centuries, because it will be highlighted by righteousness, goodness, and wisdom. Moshiach will be a righteous and honest king, outstanding in wisdom and very close to God. He closely will be a godly person. And through this, will be, we be worthy of the world to come the ultimate purpose of creation. So Mashiach is a stage in the final redemption. We'll soon come later on this evening to the 13th principle of faith, which is the revival of the dead and the ultimate Olam Haba, as we'll discuss just now, shortly. So 
So Mashiach is an important dramatic uh, stage in Olam Abba, in the ultimate world to come. In the laws of kings, Hilchas Malochim, at the very end of the Rambam's magnum opus, the Mishnah Torah, he writes as follows. Mashiach will be a king Mashiach will be a king who will restore the kingdom of David to its original glorified state. He will rebuild the holy temple, the Beit HaMikdash, and gather in the exiled Jews from across the world, no matter where they have been scattered. Will the Torah's laws and, and, and he says the Torah's laws will again be fulfilled as they were originally before the temple was destroyed. The sabbatical year and then the offerings in the temple, all of that, according to the Rambam, will be restored. And here's the crux of it. One who does not believe in Mashiach or await his coming. It's not enough to believe in him. He said in Yigdal, Yishlach Lekeitzaymin, he will send at the end of days his anointed one, lifdot to redeem those who await his final salvation. We have to await Mashiach with eager anticipation to hope and pray. When is he coming already? Please, God, let it be today. <clears throat> one who does not believe in Mashiach or await his coming, I'm quoting the Rambam, denies the most essential teachings of the prophets and the teachings of Moses and the Torah itself. So clearly it's one of the main principles of the, the fundamentals of our faith, of our religion, of our whole belief system. Now, Mashiach does not need necessarily to perform miracles. Now the question is, who is Mashiach? How will we know if he's the real Mashiach or he's a fake? There have been fake, false messiahs over the years. You know about that. There was a guy, Shapsi Tzvi. There was a guy, Jacob Frank. And they were able to uh, impress even some great rabbis of their generation a few hundred years ago. And uh, the people were led down the garden path because they were imposters. They were fakes. They were frauds. One converted to Christianity, one converted to Islam, and left many, many Jews, masses of Jews were left destroyed, disillusioned. They thought, they hoped, oh, it's finally coming. And then their hopes were dashed by these false messiahs. So Mashiach does not have to perform miracles. Who is Mashiach? A million dollar question. How will we know if he's Mashiach? The Rambam does not reveal the secret of who Mashiach is, what his name is. What he does reveal to us is the, are the criteria. How can we establish whether a person is Mashiach or not? And this became the halacha because very few other codifiers dealt with this subject other than the Rambam. So basically his word pretty much goes. He quotes the story that probably uh, over some 1900 plus years ago, after the destruction of the second temple, there was a revolt against the Romans. You know that. Bar Kokhba was the great, heroic, courageous, valiant warrior of the Jewish people at the time who mounted a rebellion against the much bigger, larger, more powerful Roman army. And Bar Kokhba and his brave warriors had many successes. Rabbi Akiva, who will mention in the Haggadah soon, on Pesach, Rabbi Akiva himself considered that Bar Kokhba was going to be none other than Mr. Mashiach, Rabbi Mashiach, sorry. 
Melech HaMashiach. Rabbi Akiva carried the bags of Bar Kokhba. So convinced was he that he's the man. Tragically, in the end, didn't pan out that way. And Bar Kokhba was killed. And the revolt was quashed. And countless Jews lost their lives. But the fact that Rabbi Akiva considered Bar Kokhba to be Mashiach proves, says the Rambam, what some of the qualifications of Mashiach are. And certain, there's two, there's two stages. He says, if he does certain things, we may assume that he is Mashiach. And if he does certain other things, then we are certain that he is Mashiach. So obviously, Bar Kokhba had many successes, and therefore Rabbi Akiva assumed that he is Mashiach, but he didn't go on to do all the others, so he was not Mashiach in the end. Says the Rambam, we may assume that an individual is Mashiach if he fulfills the following. I'm quoting the Rambam. This is a very famous and important paragraph. Listen to these points. The criteria for a person to be established, to be assumed to be Mashiach. Number one, he must be a ruler from the house of David. Number two, he can't just be a politician or a fighter. He has to be a holy person. He has to be immersed in the Torah and its commandments like King David, his ancestor. He has to be a righteous, holy Jew. He must follow both the written Torah and the oral Torah. And here's another one. He must lead all Jews back to the Torah. There are many Jews today who are not Torah observant. Mashiach will lead all Jews back to the Torah way of life. He will strengthen the observance of its laws and he will fight God's battles. He'll be a defender of the faith. That's the list. The Rambam says, if he fulfills those conditions, we may then assume, hear that word clear, clearly, assume that he is Mashiach. Not yet confirmed, not yet certain, we may assume. Next stage says the Rambam, and I quote, if he does this successfully and then rebuilds the temple on its original site in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, and gathers all the dispersed Jews from around the world, then we may be certain that he is indeed the Messiah. So, Besides being someone from the house of David and being a holy, righteous Jew and mounting campaigns to bring the whole world back to Yiddishkeit, he will not be Mashiach for sure until he rebuilds the temple, not in Uganda, not in Elat, but in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Now, at the moment, you may be aware there's some other structure there on the Temple Mount. The Dome of the Rock, Al-Aqsa, can you imagine some rabbi today going up to mount a building campaign to build a temple on the Holy Mount where, where they have those, those uh, famous mosques? It would no doubt lead to World War III. Can you just imagine? There would be bloodshed deluxe. So I can imagine a massive wave of Aliyah that I could see happening. But to rebuild the Holy Temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem at the moment with what's there now, anybody who does that, he definitely qualifies to be Mashiach. Now, here's a question. If nothing changes, except that there'll be no more anti-Semitism, what about that famous verse in Isaiah that we're going to read on the last day of Pesach? The wolf shall live with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the goat. 
That is a messianic prophecy, famous one from Isaiah. The last days of Pesach are devoted to the final redemption. The first days focus on the exodus from Egypt. The last days we focus also on the final redemption with Mashiach, and that's why we read that Haftorah. So the wolf will lie with the lamb. That's quite miraculous. What do you mean nothing's going to change? I think I once told you the story of Henry Kissinger, the great peacemaker, you know, the Vietnam War and all these peace deals he made. So when he, uh, when he left office, he was out of a job. So uh, Yitzchak Rabin was then the prime minister in Israel. So he offered Henry Kissinger a job. He said, Henry, you can be the curator of the biblical zoo in Jerusalem. So Kissinger was bored, so he became the curator. A week later, he calls Rabin. He says, Yitzchak, you got to come down to the zoo urgently. I got something amazing to show you. Rabin comes down to the zoo. He shows him in the cage with the wolf. He's walking around a little white lamb. He says, this is my greatest peace achievement, better than any war I, I broke it. The wolf and the lamb, the, the, the biblical prophecy. Rabin says, Henry, this is unbelievable. How do you do it? What's your secret? He says, well, to tell you the truth, I change lambs every day. <laughs> so it wasn't, the, it wasn't yet Mashiach. What does the Rambam say? What is the answer to this question? What do you mean life will carry on as normal, but the wolf will lie with the lamb? The Rambam says the wolf will lie with the lamb should be understood allegorically. It is a metaphor. It is not to be understood literally. Literally, it would be a massive change. Allegorically, it means there'll be no more war in the world. There'll be no more violence. Life will be peaceful. <clears throat> Elio Hanovi, Elijah the prophet, we're going to have a special fifth cup of wine for him at the Seder, the Kois Shal Eliyahu. He comes to all our Seders, he comes to all our Brisson. Elio Hanovi is also the harbinger of Mashiach. This Shabbos morning, not sorry, not, not the Shabbos, next Shabbos morning, Erev Pesach, we're going to read a special Haftarah where it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before that great and awesome day, referring to the day of redemption when Mashiach will come. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, which means he will bridge the generation gap, another sign of Mashiach's times. Or according to other interpretations, he will bring back the hearts of the fathers to Hashem through the children. Now that really is happening in our generation. So I think there's many signs that Mashiach's coming is imminent if we just look around the world today. Today we have a generation where many, the hearts of many fathers and mothers are being returned to Hashem through who? Not the rabbis, not the teachers, the children. When a young person comes home and says, mom, I've decided I'm keeping kosher, and she does not run a kosher home, it won't take long for a Yiddish mama whose son refuses to eat her food that she too will go kosher. And I have had that experience many, many times over the years. We see the children in many ways. So many young people have embraced Yiddishkeit today and they're bringing their parents back as well. <clears throat> That's one of the things that will happen <clears throat> in the time of Elio Hanovi, who was the harbinger of Mashiach. So please, God, we're going to see Elio Hanovi very shortly, and immediately thereafter, we will see Mashiach. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, I want to tell you a cute story that's in my family. I had an uncle. 
my uncle Sholem, a blessed memory. Rabbi Sholem Gordon was a very respected Rav in Newark, New Jersey, later in Maplewood, New Jersey. And uh, he was born in the Heim in Belarus, same shtetl as Rabbi Alloy. And the story in our family goes that when he was back in the shtetl, learning in Cheder as a little kid, he learned the Gemara. There's a Gemara that speaks about that there are certain cases when there's an argument between two Jews, who gets the money or how much, or who does this belong to, this object or this money, and they come to the Beth Din and, and they cannot come to an understanding or to a settlement. Each one is adamant, it's all his, it's all his, and the Beth Din cannot make a settlement between them. There are sometimes when the halacha is, the Gemara says, Yehei munach at sheyovoi elio. Let the money sit there in the Beth Din's safe, in the vault at the Beth Din, until Eliyahu Hanavi comes. When Elijah the prophet comes, please God, just before Mashiach, he will clarify all these dilemmas and he will tell us who the money belongs to rightfully. So my uncle Sholem, as a little boy in the Cheder, learned this Gemara and he asked his teacher, the following question, a very clever question. Listen to this. He says, Rebbe, I don't understand this Gemara. How can we rely on the testimony of Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet? He is only one person, what we call an Eid Echod in the Gemara, a single witness. He's a great guy, an amazing prophet, but he's only one witness. The Torah says, Al Pishnayim Edim Yokum Dover. The halacha is decided by two witnesses. As great as Elio Hanovi, the prophet Elijah may be, he's still only one witness. So, how can we go with his ruling? We need another witness. And the wise teacher answered him as follows He said, You don't understand. You don't get it, my boy. It's not that Elio Hanovi will reveal the secret of whose money it is. When Elio Novi will come, it will be a time of great revelation of godliness in the world. There will be no more wars, no more evil, no more lying, no more jealousy. People will get along. You know what will happen when Elio Novi will come? The Ganef himself will own up and say, it's not mine, it's the other guys. Because we will all become convinced of the godly way because of the godly revelation at that time. It's a cute story, but it's, I think, very illuminating as well. Now, the Rambam wrote, our sages and prophets did not long for Mashiach so that we should eat, drink, and be merry, but that we should be free to immerse ourselves in Torah and its wisdom, and at that time, there will be no more war, no famine, no drought, no jealousy or competition. There'll be prosperity and plenty. And the main occupation of people will be to know Hashem, to study his Torah. And as, is, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God. As the water covers the seabed, so too will God's presence cover the world. Okay, now we have some something that some people may consider controversial. Why don't Jews believe that Jesus was the Messiah as our Christian brethren do? So the simple answer is because Mashiach is meant to be the messenger of peace, the person who will finally bring peace to the world. As we said, it'll be an end to war and violence. 2,000 years ago, there was not an end to war and violence, and war and violence has continued tragically unabated for the last 2,000 years. So therefore, we have a problem. The Christians answer, they say, well, there'll be a second coming. And then there'll be peace on earth. Okay, that's, uh, that's their opinion, but we don't go along with it. 
However, the Rambam, Maimonides, does say something very flattering about Christianity. Uh, I had to mute whoever was the source of noise. Please make sure if you're not muted that there should be no noise in your environment. Thank you. Um, the Ramam says something very interesting, and he says that there was a very that Christianity served a very positive purpose. We may not go along with the theology of other faiths but he acknowledges that there was a very positive purpose to Christianity, namely that they prepared the world for Mashiach. Christian missionaries have come to Africa, to Tahiti, to remote islands in the South Pacific, to spread the word. The whole world knows the concept of the Messiah today, largely thanks to Christianity. So when the real Messiah arrives, Moshiach ben David, the world will accept him much more readily and easily because the idea is today very pervasive throughout the world. That's quite an interesting take, I thought. Maybe you can think of some signs in our own in our own times and our own day today, signs of the messianic age approaching. Some have said the fall of communism. Some have said that despite COVID this year, Generally speaking, the world is generally a better place than it used to be. And I heard Bill Gates say this once, that if you look at the statistics of things like child mortality and global health and education statistics uh, and the average lifespan of people around the world, you will see that the world is much better off today than it was. Of course, we still have our fair share of problems in many hotspots around the world. But if you look at the whole global situation, it is far better than it used to be. And we could even say that COVID, many people have speculated that COVID itself is a sign that God's running the world. And in somehow, in some way, it may very well be a preparation for Mashiach. I don't have it worked out uh, all that well myself, but many people have spoken on this theme. So Mashiach and the final redemption are basic to Jewish belief to the point that if you just take a look at our Siddur, at our prayers, just look in the Shmoina Esre, in the silent Amidah, we have <coughs> at least seven of the 18, 19 blessings <coughs> in the Shemayin Es of the Amida, deal with the Messianic age. Who may be goe livnei b'neim? There will come a redeemer for their for the descendants of the uh, of the of the patriarchs. Um, the Kabbi Shofar God will sound the great shofar of redemption. Hashiva Shavteinu Kvarishayna, bring back our judges like in days of old. Elidur Shalayim Irchob, return us to Jerusalem, your city. Es Tzemach Dovid Avdecha, the descendant of King David, your servant, let him flourish once again, Mashiach. Vesechzena Eneinu Bishuvcho Litzio in Berachnem, let our eyes return to see your return to Zion. Or and clearly, the, the revival of the dead, that you are the reviver of the dead. So I think that I think I counted seven of the of the 18, 19 brochas that deal with this theme. Cause your the scion, the descendant of David, your servant, uh, to flourish. Because for your salvation, do we hope every day? 
the Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, a medieval French sage, <coughs> says, send us the descendant of David, Mashiach ben David, ki lishuascha, because we have hoped and awaited your salvation every day. Says the Radak, if we will anxiously await Mashiach, then God will respond. The Gemara says an amazing thing. The Gemara says that they found out what questions we're going to ask when we get to the pearly gates after 120. The first question is, did you deal in business with integrity? Not where you're from. The second question is, did you fix times for Torah study, like you're coming tonight? And hopefully you fix it for six weeks. Well done. And, and another question in the short list of questions at the pearly gates will be, Sipita le Yeshua? Did you look forward for salvation? So that's one of the big questions we're going to be asked. Were you hoping and praying for Mashiach? Now, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 22 says, Be'itoi achishena. In its time, I will hasten it, the coming of Mashiach. Now that sounds contradictory. In its time, I will hasten it. Either Mashiach is coming in its time, in his time, or he's going to be hastened and come before his time. The Gemara asked that question. And the Gemara answers, if the Jewish people are meritorious, if we behave properly, we will merit that Mashiach's coming will be hastened. He'll come sooner. If not, he'll come in his good time. So the last time that Mashiach can possibly come is the Hebrew year 6,000, because we believe that the world as we know it will be six millennia, and then we have the seventh millennium, which is like the millennium of the Sabbath, Olam Haba. So we are now on 5781. So the bad news is there's only 219 years to go to Mashiach max. The good news is we hope that we are meritorious and we've done a lot of good stuff over the years. And we may be like midgets on giant shoulders, but the collective achievements of the Jewish people throughout the generations will please God bring us Mashiach much sooner than having to wait 219 years, God forbid. And we hope and pray that he will come today. Rambam says, Yisrael oisin tshuva umiyad heinegolim. If Jews will do tshuva, we will be redeemed immediately. Many great sages were great believers in Mashiach. The Chofetz Chaim, they tell the story of the Chofetz Chaim, who was one of the greatest rabbis of pre-war Europe. They say that he kept a small suitcase packed at his bedside, ready to go as soon as Mashiach arrives. He eagerly anticipated and hoped and was ready and believed fervently that Mashiach was indeed coming. He was all packed and ready to go. Now, as you know, in our own time, my saintly teacher, Blessed Memi de Rebbe, popularized Mashiach perhaps like no one else over the years. And people were not so into Mashiach. 50 years ago, and the Rebbe really popularized it. He spoke a lot, a lot about Mashiach. He launched a Mashiach campaign. He had children singing, we want Mashiach now, we want Mashiach now. And he even spoke about it. He gave a whole talk about that. He says, what does it mean we want? He said, we all have to want Mashiach now, not just children, the adults. And the Rebbe spoke, although English was not his first language, Yiddish and Russian, he spoke many languages, but he also spoke English. And he understood these languages very well. Listen to what the Rebbe said about the word want. If you look up the dictionary, the word want doesn't just mean desire. The word want means I feel a need. There's a want. There's a craving. There's a gap. There's a void in my life. I'm wanting. I'm missing something. 
we want Mashiach now isn't just a slogan for kids to sing. It means that we have a need for Mashiach. We have a lack in our life, a void in our life. And therefore we want Mashiach now to fill that void and to bring an end to human suffering, to bring an end to war and violence, to bring an end to pandemics and to usher in an age of peace on earth. And so from the Rebbe it went, the, the Jewish singers started singing about Mashiach and the rabbis end up every drosha with, uh, she, please God, uh, Mashiach should come from Heirov Yomenu. Orochah ben David, Mashiach, 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 they sing it at every wedding. Just one Shabbos and we'll all be free. The Gemara says if Jews would keep two Shabbos properly, Mashiach will come. But there's a Talmud, Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud says, even if we keep one Shabbos, just one Shabbos, and we'll all be free. And uh, Shweki sang uh, Shachiyona with Mashiach and uh, many singers. Uh, uh, there's, there's a million songs about Mashiach today. So once upon a time, Mashiach might have been far-fetched, where the uh, the guy said he has good job security because he's gone to watchtower waiting for Mashiach. His job is safe. And we might say, come on, you want to tell me one old rabbi is going to come and transform the whole world? Be realistic. Uh, how's this going to happen? Dafke today, it is more believable and more possible and more realistic than I think at any time in human history, that yes, a Jew called Mashiach could come and transform the whole world. Today, we live in an age of instant global communication. One individual can become a global superhero in a minute. Mashiach is more is infinitely more believable today than ever before in history. Rebbe Rashab, who's uh, lived, uh, passed away 101 years ago this month, said when Mashiach comes, it'll be in the Gazette, in the newspapers. I say today it'll be on WhatsApp, it'll be on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, it'll be all over. Okay, the Rebbe said that Mashiach's coming is imminent. We hope, we pray, we anticipate that it should be ASAP immediately. Okay, we're running out of time. So quickly, we have to finish the final principle because this is the last lecture. So please bear with me. Principle number 13, it's gonna go much quicker than principle number 12. And if you look at uh, Animamin, I believe with complete faith that there will be a resuscitation of the dead whenever the Creator wishes it to be. Um, Yigdal says, God will, God will revive the dead in his abundant kindness. Kindness, blessed forever, is his praise name. So one of the foundations of our faith, which the Ramam says a believing Jew must believe, is this final 13th principle, that the dead will live again. I know it's hard to believe this one. Probably the hardest one of all. The modern mind. What are you, crazy rabbi? You want to tell me, West Park Cemetery, the old going to stand up? What is this, an Alfred Hitchcock movie? I once heard a guy say, you know, he sees a guy come to shul on Shabbos in the old days when we had a kiddush, you know, a brocha. The guy has three l'chaims at the brocha. Then he goes, then he goes from the kiddush, he goes home for a big lunch and he has another three l'chaims and he has a big fat cholent and then he crashes on the nearest bed and he's snoring away. The guy looks at him, he says, you know, if this guy actually wakes up, I'm going to believe in the revival of the dead. <laughs> Why is it so difficult? If God could create the world from scratch, which we have no problem in believing, why should it be difficult to believe that he could recreate the world that he once created before? The re revival of the dead is mentioned throughout our prayers, many biblical proof explicitly in the prophets Isaiah and the book of Daniel. 
we say in the Amidah, Baruch Atah Hashem, Mechayeh HaMetim, blessed as Hashem who re revives the dead. We say in the morning, blessing Elokai, Neshoma Shanasatabi, the soul that you put into me, uh, revives me and gives me life. In the end, you will take it away from me. But in the end, Lahachzira Bilo Asadlova, you will return it to me in time to come. Body and soul will be reunited. <clears throat> so while other things may be understood allegorically, this one must be taken literally, says the Rambam. That is a machlekes between the Rambam and the Ramban. Which is the ultimate olam haba? Is it a soul up in heaven? Or is it the soul that comes back to a body down on earth? The Rambam says it's a spiritual. The Ramban Nachmanadi says it's physical is the ultimate. And the mystics Kabbalah seem to side with the Ramban actually on this one. The Rebbe once gave a very scholarly talk explaining that both are right. And it's speaking about two different eras, two different periods. But Olam Haba generally means that the whole world will finally come to its ideal state. The entire purpose for which God created the world will then be fulfilled. We will then have a perfect world, not a dishonest, hypocritical, corrupt, violent world, a perfect world, godliness revealed. You won't need social media. The whole world will feel that God's presence is with us, that things have changed. Um, okay, um, I'm going to touch on one quick thing. It really needs a whole lecture, but I know people are always asking this question, <clears throat> and that is reincarnation. The mystic Kabbalah speaks about reincarnation in time to come. That uh, now reincarnation means that the same soul. Uh, was in different bodies in different generations. Gemara says Pinchas and Eliyahu had the same neshama, for example. And most souls today have been here before. But that means that same soul has inhabited different bodies throughout history. So when Mashiach comes and the revival of the dead follows, some say it'll be 40 years later, we're not sure, which body will get the soul? There's one soul for five bodies, who's gonna get the soul? They're going to fight it out? So the simple answer is that a soul is not physical. A soul is spiritual. A soul is a part of God. A soul is a little piece of God that he puts inside of each of us to give us life. God is eternal, spiritual, infinite, and a soul is as well. Just as the rays of the sun can illuminate millions of windows and mil mil millions of bedrooms every morning throughout the world, uh, it's one sun, so too the one soul can actually give life to many bodies. Now we have different names for the soul, nefesh, ruach, neshama. And the Kabbalah speaks about two others that you probably haven't heard of, chaya and yechida. So at least five names for the souls. For sure, for sure five souls can be vivified by one body on different levels. I gave, when I was doing the Jewish sound radio program for over 20 years, once upon a time, I'm almost finished, guys. Um, bear with me. Uh, I saw at the SABC, I saw a 24 track tape recorder, which they used to do to record symph sym symphony orchestras. And one track was the brass section, one track, one track was the string section, the violins, one track was the piano, one track was the percussion, one track was the vocalists. And then they mixed it all together, 24 track machine, a piece of tape. One piece of physical tape had 24 tracks. You turned the switch, you heard the trumpets, you heard the, you turned the switch again, you heard the violins, you heard the, turn the switch again, you heard the, the, the Pavarotti, whoever. A piece of physical tape has 24 tracks. You want to tell me a spiritual soul can't have 24 tracks? So that's not really a problem. Um, I'm going to conclude by, uh, we're almost in Pesach, and we say, Lashana Habob Yerushalayim, 
when you say at the Seder at the end, Lashon HaBobi Rishulayim, next year in Jerusalem, it does not mean we have to wait a whole year until Mashiach comes and we go to Jerusalem. Mashiach can come immediately so that next year when we will recite the Seder, we will be in Jerusalem. And don't worry, your big homes and swimming pools in South Africa or California or wherever you're living, uh, you're not going to have to crowd into a little tiny flat in Maya Sha'orim when Mashiach comes. Don't worry. Have no fear. Life will be good for us when Mashiach comes. We will not lose any creature comforts. So please, God, you can pray for Mashiach. You must anticipate and hope for Mashiach any minute. And please, God, together, our collective wanting Mashiach to come now and praying for his coming and believing in his coming and anticipating his imminent coming will indeed be a catalyst to help bring Mashiach now and the revival of the dead where will families will be reunited with our loved ones and we will live happily ever after. I thank you for joining us in this series. And God bless you all. You can unmute yourselves. You may ask questions. You may uh, comment. Feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Could I ask a question? Could I ask a question, please, Rabbi? Yes, one second, Dave. I've been asked to give a bibliography. So let me give you a quick bibliography of some of the books I've used. Hmm. Um, Let's see how we look. How do we look? There's a small booklet by Rabbi Arya Kaplan on the fundamentals. No. There's I, another book called I, The 13 Principles of I'm Faith by Rabbi Gurari. There's a book called With Perfect Faith by Rabbi Dr. J. David Bleich. There's the Torah of Faith, the 13th Prince by Rabbi Zachary Fendel. If anybody really wants to look at it, just send me an email or the shul and I will, uh, I'll be happy to post it uh, on the shul website no. or what's it's new, whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. someone had a question. Was it David? Yes. Uh, uh, Rabbi, what about the... The, sub, the subject of Gog and Magog and um, okay. big okay. destruction, big uh, disasters and things like that. Okay, okay. that's our, our Magadan, they call it. That's a very good question. Uh, Gog and Magog were two nations who would have a big war before <laughs> Mashiach comes. And there's many different interpretations. Nobody's 100% exactly certain, but many great rabbis have speculated that we have we could have been through that already we don't have to have any more wars for mashiach to come world war ii where so many dozens of millions of people lost their lives and so many countries were involved it was a world war would certainly qualify in their view as gog and magog and armageddon we don't need another armageddon of anything to, to blow us to pieces um, and and the, the big destruction and disasters and uh, volcanic eruptions and things like that before we've, we've, we've had we've had more than enough natural disasters, volcanoes and tsunamis and earthquakes and whatnot. We've had all of that. We don't have to look forward to any more disasters. <clears throat> the can come tomorrow. We've had enough disasters throughout history. Someone's asking a question on the chat line. Why are Jews not coming en masse to Israel? Well, I actually think more Jews are coming to Israel now than ever before, especially from South Africa. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also France and other places. But this will be one of the functions of Mashiach. It, it may be today, it may be the function of the Aliyah department. But in the Rambam's view, it was the function of Mashiach who will actually bring all the Jews back to Israel. Rabbi, Any can other? I ask a question, please? Yes, you may. Who's speaking? It's Rosalind and Christine. Good yes, evening. Um, the third base Hamikdash is is built already. It's complete in Shemaim. Will it come down a complete structure? Okay, so <laughs> the, 
to answer your question, uh, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the answer is that we know a lot of things, we know a lot of principles, but we don't know every last detail. It's still a mysterious part of, of Torah. And the Rambam says we shouldn't speculate too much on things that we don't know. There is one tradition that the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple Jew, will come down miraculously from heaven to the Temple Mount. That is one opinion. But there are other opinions that we will have to build the temple with our hands. Uh, and this is some, a say, some say it depends. Uh, are we meritorious? If we're meritorious, it'll come down from heaven. If we're not meritorious, we'll have, we'll, have, we'll have to build it. Hmm? Not on mute. No, it comes up. Thank you. Okay, that's the best I can do to answer that question. Thank you, Rabbi. Any other questions? Thank you for all your very kind comments in the chat line. It has been my absolute pleasure, and I've enjoyed it. And I've enjoyed seeing so many of you. And uh, Nice that we have people in London. Thank you to the Bloombergs for joining us from London. Thank you, everybody, for your very kind comments. Oh, thank you. And Mashiach Ben Yosef. Yes, there, Mashiach Ben Yosef is written about in the Rambam. Okay, I, I had uh, an hour to cover a, a great deal of, of material. And I didn't get to Mashiach ben Yosef. There is a tradition that will be more than one Mashiach. One will die and the other will, uh, will, 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 will flourish. But we didn't have time for that. So maybe there'll be another opportunity. I think it's quite amazing that you've signed peace treaties with six Arab countries and there's another four on the way. Thank you. I asked before, what signs of Mashiach do we see in the world today? And I think that is definitely a, a sign of the Messianic times, that Israel is signing peace treaties with, with countries that were sworn enemies for decades. And, 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 and an, a, a UAE ambassador is already in, in Israel. And, and uh, we're flying over their airspace. It's, it's, uh, it's inspirational. Okay, so I wish everybody a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Have a wonderful Yontif. We finished this. I made sure to finish this uh, this week, not next week, when everybody will be very busy. We were meant to finish Monday, but thanks to ESCOM, we're finishing today. So thank you for joining us, and we will hopefully uh, post the, uh, the recording. I trust it came out successfully, please God, uh, on, the, uh, on the WhatsApp groups. And uh, if you don't get it, please uh, send us an email. And we will respond and send you the recordings, etc. And stay tuned for uh, further adult ed education opportunities from Sydney Shul after Pesach, whether our regular shurim or special events. It's been a pleasure going through this course. I've learned a lot, and I hope you've learned something along the way. So thank you for being part of it. Thank you for your kind words to all of you. And uh, God bless you all. I'm going to close the meeting now. Good night and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. And Chag Kasher V'Sameach. And God bless you all. Thank you, Rabbi. It was very, very good. Thank you.